Um, before we start, I want to acknowledge the land on which we meet today, the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, whose land was never ceded, and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to all First Australians who are joining us today. Well, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this session on transforming the care economy, policy, delivery and justice. It's great to be here with such an esteemed panel and with so much interest and expertise in the audience too. So thank you very much for joining us. And I'll start by providing some context to this session. During the COVID-19 pandemic, like many of you, we noticed a significant uptick in both paid and unpaid care. Women and girls were especially affected due to dominant patriarchal gender norms, which placed the expectations of caregiving almost entirely upon them. The colliding impacts of climate change, COVID-19 and conflict have exacerbated issues of caregiving in Asia and the Pacific, where women and girls perform four times more unpaid care than men and boys. When speaking with our partners and donors, we found very little coordination and data as it relates to care in the region, despite high demands for care work. So we saw an opportunity to change the dynamic and build momentum towards collaborative action. To address challenges with care coordination, together with our partners, the Asia Foundation organized two convenings over the last year, to contribute to the momentum for mobilising a care movement both regionally and globally. The Bali Care Economy Dialogue was a regional convening that took place in November 2022 on the sidelines of the G20. It was designed to elevate issues of decent work, dignity of care and building a care ecosystem. So to inform the discussions there, we developed a white paper which presented the latest evidence and data on care in the Asia Pacific region. And one of the outcomes of the convening was a regional roadmap for action co-created by the participants. Following Bali, we were invited by Women Deliver to organize a global pre-conference event on care to build on the outcomes from Bali with a larger group of organizations across the globe. This event in Kigali in Rwanda focused on strengthening care policies and intersectional movements for care justice. And one of the findings from our uh, white paper was unsurprisingly that Asia and the Pacific are extremely diverse across incomes, cultures, infrastructure and development when it comes to the care economy. Countries in the region grapple with different types of care related challenges based on many factors including income level, demographic considerations and governance structures. So for example, countries like Japan, South Korea and Singapore are experiencing large ageing populations and low birth rates which, leading, which is leading them to prioritise elder care whereas low and middle income countries like Indonesia, which still have a large youth population, are prioritising issues like childcare. In the Pacific, however, virtually no data exists and policies are more nascent. Across all countries, we found also found that care related migration is a big issue and domestic work is a large source of migration, even more so than in other, la other parts of the world. These convenings help bring together a diverse group of people working on issues of care and the white paper helped establish a common set of facts and principles. We've also been socialising the issues at other convenings including APEC and ASEAN hosted events on the care economy and we've supported country level convenings in Malaysia, Mongolia, Fiji, Thailand and the Philippines to translate regional level advocacy to national level action. In terms of next steps in collaboration with our care partners, we're currently in the process of synthesizing the insights and recommendations that emerged from Bali and Kigali and the other regional convenings on the care economy into a zero draft global roadmap for care, hopefully with agreed targets. We'll then conduct consultations to refine the document further before socialising it at large decision-making forums such as the G20s, the G7s and APEX. 
We hope that this document will be used to inform care priorities across government, civil society and the private sector. And this is crucial since, as we know, there's a care tsunami headed our way and we need an ecosystem approach to strengthening care policies, delivery systems and movements for care justice. And all this work is starting to pay off. At the Bali Care Economy Dialogue, the US government announced that it would join the Global Alliance for Care. Recently, the Malaysian Prime Minister announced the care economy as one of its top priorities. The Canadian government is com committing new funds to address issues of care in Asian countries as well as in Africa. And there's growing interest in a civil society global care fund. So with that overview, today's session is focused on how we build on this momentum. Most of the panellists here have engaged in one or more of the forums that I've mentioned and have been leading critical work to advance access to childcare, elder care and disability care. Or they've been focused on mobilising funds to invest in promising models or engaging in advocacy to strengthen care movements. According to a recent report from Pivotal Ventures, Paid care is a $648 billion sector and unpaid care is valued at approximately 10% of global GDP and that's 11 trillion US dollars. Given this, how do we shift power, policies, money, voice and norms to ensure that women and girls don't continue to carry the burden of unpaid care and ensure that care workers have access to decent work and wages? and that people have choice and dignity of care. What actions are needed to build a resilient and inclusive care ecosystem in the region? This session is designed to explore these questions and to help translate insights into action. So with that introduction, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers. Nalini Singh, to my immediate right, is the Executive Director of Fiji Women's Rights Movement with decades of experience in leading important work to advance women's rights and gender equality in Fiji and the Pacific. Susan Neo, in the middle, is the CEO and founder of Love Care in Indonesia, a dynamic platform for matching verified care workers and families needing access to care. And Akshat Singhal, on my far right, is the co-founder of Gender Lab in India, a youth-led movement focused on transforming gender norms, including care norms, through school-based and fellowship programs. And I'm Jane Sloan, and I'll be moderating this session. We'll uh, start this panel session with you, Nalini. Um, Fiji Women's Rights Movement participated in the Bali Care Economy Dialogue and subsequently the Pacific Care Forum in Fiji. Can you share some of the priority issues and actions from a Pacific context that emerged from these convenings and also more broadly from Fiji Women's Rights um, Movement's own work in advocacy over many years? Thank you, Jane. Um, warm bula vinaka to everybody. Um, and I um, also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are on today. Um, so for those that are not familiar with the Fiji Women's Rights Movement, we are a national feminist um, organization that's um, you know, committed itself to removing all forms of discrimination against women through institutional reform and attitudinal change. Um, but let me say that it's not just FWRM, but we together with other women's rights organizations in Fiji have been at the forefront of pushing for the recognition, um, reduction and redistribution of communal and domestic care work for decades now. Um, women, we all know, do the majority of the um, unpaid care work in Fiji, while you know we are averaging about 34% of paid work, and that's the context we are in right now. So for us, the question then becomes um, a little different. You know, it's, it's more so in the sense of um, where are we putting our women in you know, if we're talking about employment? If women are already overburdened with unpaid care work at home, and in their communities because of their gender roles assigned um, to them um, is creating paid jobs in that same sector the ol only alternative? If it is, then how do we make sure that we mitigate the vulnerabilities our women um, you know, will venture into when they, when they do the paid care work? And how do we drive in the message of redistribution 
of unpaid care work at home if we are, you, you know, sending our women to fill that gap abroad. We are not redistributing and changing the unjust system in that. So um, our key priorities from the Bali Care Dialogues and Pacific Care Forum in Fiji um, are, you know, in, in three, three basic points. One is understanding the context. So for Fiji in the Pacific Island region, you know, it's patriarchal, you know, um, in terms of norms and values, and that seeps through um, into institutional structures and even our economy. The manifestation of, of this is seen where women's economic empowerment and participation in the labor market is very poorly represented. And it, influence, and it is largely influenced by social and cultural uh, norms. So I think when we are talking about the care economy, we must have this lensing and context in mind. Where are we right now? When do we look at the care model it, and, and how it foresees women taking on additional care responsibilities of children and the, uh, and the elderly? You know, where's the women's voice in all of this? Additionally, where is that element of choice for women? So from our three country study um, that we did on older women and their contribution to the, to the country's economies, this included Fiji, Samoa, and the Marshall Islands, you know, in, in you know, collaboration with the Asia Foundation, you know, we saw that the voice of older women and their choice when we are talking about the care economy was, you know, invisible. You know, in venturing into care work, something is, you know, was that something that the older women even wanted to do? Or uh, were there other ways that they wanted to contribute? With, uh, and, and we must also ensure that when we are talking about care work, that it doesn't end up only increasing more c care burden on women, you know? So it's, it's, <laughs> it's very important to talk to women about this. It's not just about the money, it's, it's also about that equation of how much care work burden are we adding onto, onto them. And finally, as you said, uh, Jane, the, the care data. So for us at, S at FWRM, any advocacy work we do, we try our best to link it to evidence-based analysis and, and data. So one of the key reflections from the Bali Care Dialogue and the Pacific Care Forum in Fiji was that, you know, we have limited to no data available when we are talking about the care economy in the Pacific Islands. And from our research, we note that there's a, there, there are a lot of retired and older women from Fiji who are venturing into care work abroad, you know, and they are undocumented. They are not following any schemes. They're, they're, they're moving into filling this gap. So the question then is, you know, what kind of security do they have? You know, what health insurance, for instance, schemes do the older women have, knowing very well the myriad of health issues older women go through themselves? Um, and the fact that we don't talk about half the issues, including menopause. Um, human rights vulnerabilities, you know, it is also showing that women work all their lives earning for their families, but come retirement, they have little to no income security in old age, which is what is driving them back into doing this work in the care economy and back into the workforce again. Uh, and often that's not what they would like to be doing. Yeah, I think you've made so many important points in what you've shared. And I think for me, it again really underscores the importance of investing in feminist movements, feminist rights organisations in the Pacific. I know that it was a conversation with you, Nalini, where you said, we just don't know what's happening to older women. We need that research. And so getting the funds to the organisations that can elevate the voice of women, um, to your point about where's the voice of women who can undertake that, um, that research and data capture using feminist methodologies is just so crucial. Um, and there's just so much more to be done. I think we're, we're really only at the starting point. Um, Susan, I want to turn to you next. You're an entrepreneur. Uh, you started your business or company using technology to connect care workers to families needing care in Indonesia. What is the role of digital innovations in addressing gaps in care services? And how is your business, Love Care, using technology, including AI, um, as part of its model? Great. Thank you, Jane. So before that, I would like you to imagine that, imagine the world where we 
uh, it's very easy for us to find caregivers as easy as we are ordering our meal or Uber. That's what we are trying to do. So digital innovations play a pivotal role in revolutionizing care services by enhancing personalization, accessibility, and overall also efficiency. Digital uh, traditional care model often struggle with adapting to individual needs and scaling effectively. And technology acts as a bridge to overcome all these challenges. For instance, through our advanced matching algorithm, we can pair caregivers with families based on specific preferences. And this ensure a more customized cat experience. And the beauty of technology is that it can be done from anywhere and at any time. And it's scalable. It can be even replicated to the other countries or other cities of uh, uh, areas in Indonesia, for example. And furthermore, technology enables um, uh, continuous learning and also improvement. At LoveCare, we harness data analytics to uh, monitor service quality and also outcome. And this not only refines our services, but also uh, help us to uncover trends and unmet needs. For instance, from our data, we might reveal a rising needs of specific types of care in particular areas. And it helps us to proactively adjust our offerings. And it's very important so we can meet the demands quickly and smartly as well. And lastly, uh, the crucial aspect of um, that cannot be forgotten is about the empowerment of care workers. Our applications provide the care workers with the comprehensive support system, including access to job opportunities, and as well as client reviews for better uh, improvement and point and rewards to uh, encourage better performance, as well as um, efficient digital payment method. This not only increases the uh, quality of care services, but also it helps it helps them to uh, you know make a better decisions in their life, not only for the uh, care workers but also for the patients. And this also can help us to make a better system to help both of the parties. In essential at Love Care, we utilize technology not only for the sake of innovations but as a means to, um, as a means to help the both sides, uh, you know, to overcome the needs of both uh, the providing the care and also those receiving the care. And talking about AI, everybody's talking about AI and even using it. And love care also embracing AI. But we are not only using AI just for following the trends, but we see the positive impact of AI. We make a we integrate AI into our system to build a better and smarter matching system and even reporting system that can be used for users to make an even better informed decisions. Our ultimate goal is trans to transform the care economy and, and where we can help uh, to, to fulfill the needs of both receiving care and also those uh, providing care. Yeah, I think uh, what's really powerful about Love Care's model is the fact that families can, uh, can be given a range of care worker profiles to be able to choose and then care workers are also given that all the social protections through that technology model so as you say you can respond rapidly and the fact that you're responding to different forms of care rather than just prioritizing one form of care and also I didn't notice before I spoke with you the other day Susan but you can provide care care to a family for one hour or for a year and so it's very flexible and you even have dementia care specialists some of the areas where we're seeing um, a, a really rapid rise as well. So it's a, it's a powerful model. Um, Akshat, I want to turn to you next. I have to remember to just keep the mic close here. Uh, uh, Gender Lab is a phenomenal youth-led movement, uh, working with young people of all genders to change gender norms, including care norms. Can you share more about how you're doing this? Uh, thanks, Jane. And uh, just before I start we, to visually introduce myself, uh, I'm a tall person with long hair and short beard, and I'm wearing a Vitesh shirt with black flowery print, print on it. So, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for being here, and thanks, Jane, Nalini, and Susan for uh, doing what you're doing. Uh, there's lots to learn from there. And uh, yeah, it's a privilege to be here because um, I am, uh, as a man speaking on subject on care, I feel um, uh, and I say privilege because 
uh, I literally like built my career on uh, the unpaid care work of my mother and sisters uh, back home. And uh, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that before I start speaking anything on it. And secondly, um, yeah, I, I think as uh, mentally important for us to really understand and recognize the systemic, uh, you know, invisibilization of unpaid care work, um, and uh, which is one of the objectives at the Gender Lab where, uh, back home where uh, as a nonprofit, we are trying to empower adolescents and youth uh, to shift gender narratives by uh, building critical thinking through our grassroots programs. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the way we do it is uh, we have these experiential learning programs which are attached to schools. So we have worked with about 50,000 adolescents over the last decade or so with around 200 plus schools in both urban and rural geographies. Um, uh, yeah, the programs are based on experiential learning format where we combine classroom training with uh, community service. So uh, girls and boys go and take up issues in their own communities and in that process learn about themselves. Uh, yeah, I mean, our programs are right now uh, segregated because we're working with school systems and we feel it's important to start our conversations with girls and boys separately. And uh, yeah, that's where uh, we have been doing this, these programs. Uh, and uh, one of the other programs that we run is uh, other fellowships, which are for people for, of all genders. And uh, also, uh, while working uh, on this, uh, doing this work, actually it started, originally started with the uh, objective of building leadership skills, uh, agency and voice of adolescent girls. But soon we realized that we need to also engage boys and men in this entire conversation of gender equality. Uh, so, yeah, it was easier for us to roll out a program with boys as well. And later on, we added a program called How We Raise Our Boys with Educators. So we are doing this in 10 languages in India because it's important to have these conversations on gender, masculinities, and sexuality with educators in regional languages as well. So yeah, just, I think we do a lot of like different programs, but I would like to just stick to one specific aspect of our programming, especially with boys, which is around care work uh, because uh, our program with boys talks about, uh, so we, we, like, we try to deconstruct this entire idea of gender and sex. We talk about notions of masculinity. We, we do it, uh, we talk about violence, unpaid care work and so on. And we use a lot of like creative tools, videos, et cetera, to uh, do these conversations. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, I think the, the way it sort of looks is uh, that through the program, these boys would sort of make small groups and then they take up issues in their own communities or schools. So, uh, and then they look at these social issues through lens of gender. So it could be a project on bullying or corporal punishment. So issues that affect us or others, or even a project around unpaid care work. So for example, a group of boys felt that uh, they used to be teased because they would freely talk about uh, doing work at home and uh, then they, they prepared a, a small play around it to talk about it. So, so yeah, I mean, boys take up these small projects uh, in their communities. But, uh, but yeah, I would like to uh, share some of the learnings that we have had through this work and uh, uh, like we really intend to create an enabling ecosystem to transform the ideas of masculinities and and what we've learned is that we need to really create safe spaces uh, if we, we want to understand, if we want to really shift the understanding of care with boys. Um, uh, because in these safe spaces is where we can open up the conversation of patriarchy and power with them, right? Because we cannot talk to them without them realizing the power and privilege they hold. Uh, secondly, I think it, we've learned that uh, uh, it's important to build this language of care and violence with them because the moment they get a language, they're able to identify it as well. Uh, thirdly, uh, we cannot do this in isolation. So we cannot just go and talk about only unpaid care work. We need to do it in conjunction with uh, other issues or other ideas of gender, masculinity, sexuality, and so on. Um, uh, and also I think, uh, we, we really need to start early. We need to start early and, and to be able to shift these norms um, and, and build a community of peers uh, where boys can really normalize uh, unpaid care work. Uh, so, yeah, because this, I mean, this would also involve engaging with them on broader range of issues um, and building leadership in them to challenge gender norms in everyday lives because 
only if they're able to embody this in practice on an everyday basis, they'll be able to shift it. So, um, and lastly, uh, I, I just want to end this uh, uh, question with is that uh, we need to also engage fathers uh, and educators to be role models and enablers for the boys to build these essential mindsets and life skills. Only then we'll see some transformation happening because all by themselves, it's not easy to go back home and start shifting uh, uh, these norms. Yeah, that's where. Thanks so to much, Akshar. I wish there was a gender lab in every school in every community because I, I think this work to change gender norms around care um, is so necessary, and, and your approach is so powerful. If you get the chance, I encourage you to go online on YouTube and and check out some of the gender lab videos. Uh, so, Susan, uh, how do you um, how did you mobilise funding for love care? And what do governments and the private sector need to do to make it possible for innovations like love care to grow and expand in other contexts? Okay, uh, in the initial stages of love care, we embraced the bootstrap mentality, funding ourselves to build a resilient and self-sustaining business. By reinvesting our earnings, we focus more on building a robust platform that exemplifies the potential of digital technologies in care economy. Um, but then we also uh, received grants from the United Nations of Women, where we are uh, one of the winners of the program. And uh, also after that, uh, we focus really, really focus on building a stronger and proven con uh, proof of concept in the market. And today, having a strong foundations and proven concept, we have finally opened the doors to the external funding to scale our impact to the other regional areas. Um, and look. The history of our, our self-funded history sends a powerful message really to our uh, potential investors that we are committed. We are really committed that we are uh, also, you know, using our own pocket money <laughs> to, to invest in the company. And also we are scalable and ready uh, to be uh, expanded, uh, also elevated to the other uh, uh, countries. And Moving forward, we seek collaborative effort actually uh, from both governments and also private sectors. Government can facilitate uh, the ecosystem for care companies like ours to expand and grow with the support in the form of uh, tax breaks, for example, grants and policies that recognize the unique challenges and also contributions of care companies like ours. And meanwhile, the uh, private sectors can provide um, strategic partnerships and venture capitals to take innovations like love care to the next level. By acknowledging the value of companies that have successfully self-funded, then both government and private entities can actually help uh, provide or ensure that uh, mature or market-tested companies like love care um, have the resources to grow and expand ultimately revolutionizing the care industry on a larger scale. Yeah, so I believe that the government and public, uh, private sectors can uh, help us to uh, uh, build to the next level. Yeah, I think the story of Love Care is such a, a great story because it's a group of women who came together, together with one good man, as I understand, uh, to create Love Care and that you've really wanted to retain that control in Indonesia rather than be bought out or taken to a different country and that you're really growing it uh, organically in a way where you can maintain that control. And as you've said, you've, you've really underscored the vital role of government in creating an enabling environment for that kind of innovation um, and investment, which we know is gonna be so important for the time ahead. Aksha, uh, what do you see as the role of youth movements in influencing policies and in building uh, momentum for care justice in India as, as well as elsewhere? Yeah, I, I think uh, one thing that we're learning uh, on this uh, work of care with boys is that there's a lot of shame attached to uh, engaging with care work for boys themselves. So um, if we have to uh, continue doing this work, uh, uh, we need to acknowledge that. And secondly, uh, we also assume boys and men to be breadwinners um, as, they, as they grow up, right? So there's a lot of pressure and it's also assumed that all they need to do is just provide financial care. Uh, because I was just having a conversation with a group of boys and I just tried to understand what are their perceptions about care, you know, and, and they were like, uh, you know, uh, so some of them, what, what sort of got concluded in that conversation is that uh, 
some of them ended up saying that uh, their father uh, brings financial care and that's what their job is but my mother gives emotional care and she uh, she's actually uh, uh, cooking for me and just taking care of me and and that's how it is so i think uh, try we need to also like learn to how to dissolve these uh, ideas these binaries of understanding of care for boys and um, i think removing shame will be a critical aspect uh, around it and uh, like some of the initiatives, like in India, there's this organization called We Are Yuva. Yuva in Hindi means, in, in English means uh, youth. Uh, so they they do they use very creative ways uh, to normalize care work uh, and engagement of care work by men and boys uh, uh, through social media. And I don't know if uh, I mean you would know about Men Care. It's a global fatherhood campaign. It's been done for almost now 10 years. Uh, they've really built a lot of momentum. They have come out with State of the World's Father's Report this year as well. And uh, they, they've brought really important statistics and recommendations out there. Um, I would really encourage you to look at it, but it's it's an amazing campaign, which is trying to, again, normalize care work through advocacy and a lot of programs. And uh, when G20 uh, Summit happened this year, uh, as the Gender Lab, we also tried to push this entire idea of care economy in uh, alignment with masculinities because we need to also uh, talk about it uh, together um, and yeah I mean lastly I, I, would, I would like to say that uh, if we really have to build this movement and participation of uh, youth we need to acknowledge that in a country in a, in a context like India often the burden of paid care work uh, is on those who belong to lower caste and lower class uh, communities and uh, I mean, we, we cannot really um, go f too far without acknowledging these intersectionalities. Uh, yeah, really important points. Thank you. I mean, I think, again, you've just uh, really underscored the importance of investing in diverse youth movements, uh, including paying attention to issues of not only class but caste um, in leading work around care norms. Um, Nalini, care migration is a, a critical issue for Fiji and many Pacific countries. Um, and Australia, of course, is a major destination country for Pacific care workers. Uh, so what do you see is needed in order to ensure stronger safeguards for uh, care workers from Pacific countries? And what's also needed to bolster a strong care ecosystem in Pacific countries so that they're not depleted through care migration? Yeah, I think uh, my colleagues and friends who are from, from Fiji will agree the way, or the haphazard way in which um, you know, the migration for work um, in um, this area and, and others has happened in relation to migrating for, you know, short-term work or seasonal work, as they say. Um, so um, <laughs> there's a lot of learnings from, uh, you know, the, the different, different sectors. I mean, I think the first thing that needs to happen is um, the in this industry needs to be carefully regulated. Um, and we must ensure that you know we are building the care infrastructure in the Pacific um, with you know all the different uh, stakeholders um, on you know who are linked to working on the care economy, and to ensure that the care economy is within the legal frameworks. Because you know we have to remember that um, okay, this might be new for us. But the care economy, or what we know it in, in ILO terms as, you know, domestic, foreign domestic workers and all of that, you know, it, it's been happening for, for decades in, in Asia, Middle East, and, and other areas. And there are, um, you know, so many ways in which um, there's, you know, labor rights violations. Um, the work is done in the private sphere, so, you know, where's the jurisdiction for legislation? And, and security, all of that you know, comes into place. So there is a lot that has happened in the world. And so we must use um, you know, the, the good and, and the lessons learned um, you know, in terms of building our own frameworks in, for our context. And we must ensure that the investments and interventions that are made are, you know, of course, gender responsive. Second would be training and awareness raising. You know, so it's not just training you know, on the work requirements, but interlinked to everything else that, that life is about. You know, so we're talking about 
you know, finance management, you know, how to live abroad um, safely, you know, how do you get integrated back you know, home when you return, how do you understand the laws of, of the country you are going to, issues of violence in the workplace and, you know, where to seek help from when you need it, all of these questions and more, you know, and, and what we have seen in countries that I, I don't even think it's, it's half a day training, it's just a hours um, or so, you know, you go and listen to a seminar and then you're off. Um, so that does not prepare anybody for um, uh, work, um, even if that's in a private home, it's still work. Um, and in reference to the three country study that we've done um, in uh, looking at older women's contribution, you know, we need to make sure that there is compliance that way to international standards as well. Um, and, and the one for the older populations is the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging, you know, or MIPA. And not many of us are aware about this, to ensure that, you know, we are, we are using the protection and the safeguards for older women, for the rights of older women who are looking at, um, you know, contributing to work still. So things like health insurance covers, um, working conditions for women who are, you know, older and, you know, then coming back into work. So, you know, it's very important that, you know, those standards are, um, you know, complied with. And the next would be the, da the data. You know, we have to use data um, to ensure that, you know, all the policies, the care policies, and any regulations that are made are, uh, are centered around that. But we don't have it, but we have to start somewhere to do that. And finally, as I said earlier, we need to talk to the women. We need to talk to the women to see what actually do they want to do, you know? Who actually wants to go abroad to do the same work in someone else's private home? Um, and also, the, on the flip side, you know, who are they leaving behind and how do they feel about that so that this economy is built not just on the technicalities and the financial side of things, but also on empathy and, and sensitivity and care um, in relation to who leaves our country um, to, you know, find employment. Yeah, such critical points. I think it would be a game changer uh, to secure investment for a, a Pacific Care Research Observatory to, to capture that care data, and especially if it were coupled with a, um, a care fund, a global care fund that was really investing in feminist organisations and movements focused on care justice, um, where um, you were being represented and women's voices were being represented, particularly um, to influence the regulatory requirements that you spoke about. Uh, Susan, we're seeing much more government investment in childcare than in elder care and disability care, also because childcare is seen as a, a positive investment in future generations, whereas long-term care is often seen as a, a deficit model. Um, we also know that with an ageing Asia, there's a need for more investment in long-term care. What do you think is needed for greater overall investment by both the public and private sectors in elder care and, and disability care? Okay, in addressing the imbalance in uh, investment of uh, uh, the care investment in elder care and disability care, it is crucial for us to recognize the sandwich generations, those caring for both ch uh, children and also aging parents. Their dual responsibility often impact their uh, productivity and potential uh, to contribute uh, to the economy. By providing support, uh, support in elder care and disability care, we are actually empowering these generations to contribute more effectively to the economy. Yes, child care is an investment in our future, but elder care and disability care should not be seen from a deficit lens. Instead, we have to view it as an equally positive investment in the quality of life and dignity of our populations. By providing the care, uh, 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 disability care and elderly care, we will empower the, the generations and to contribute more effectively. And also, uh, it is also about the dignity of our population, right, with ripple effects across all ages and sectors of our society. To catalyze greater investment in elderly care and disability care, it is very important for us to embrace a multifaceted approach. Data is indeed a cornerstone. It uh, helps us to quantify the economic impact of the sandwich generation and the potential benefits of investing in care. However, it's also about changing narratives. We must reframe 
elder care, and also disability care as a sector ripe for innovation and growth with significant opportunities for private sectors to develop new services, new technologies, new innovations, and also new care of models. So the public sectors, on the other hand, can incentivize investment by uh, through policy reforms, public-private partnership, I always saying that, public-private partnerships, as well as uh, subsidize. By recognizing the value of care economy, the government can build a fertile ground for private investment, and that's very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, thank you again. Really important points, including that so many uh, women particularly, but people are dealing with both issues of caring for young children as well as caring for family members with disabilities and elderly parents as well. And so uh, making the case for that investment as a positive investment in communities and countries is, is so crucial. Aksha, in your work with adolescents um, on leadership and, and masculinities, um, in what ways uh, have conversations on care and climate come up? And if you can, I can just ask you to just speak for one minute. I'm just conscious of time and allowing questions from the audience then too. Sure. Uh, the thing is, I think we just started to explore this intersection of care and climate. Uh, it was just about a couple of years ago, in fact, uh, Asia Foundation supported us with a project. And uh, this project was uh, where we got about 20 adolescent girls to come together and take up a project on uh, what they called was, uh, I will speak up for climate justice. And uh, and, and in that project, what, what uh, came up as one of the examples was, uh, so they were supposed to do storytelling and documenting some stories through videos in their own areas. And uh, so this was a group of girls in one of the remote rural areas of India in North uh, India. And they, what they figured was that uh, a lot of plastic was being used uh, to fuel the ch uh, traditional chulas, right? Chulas are the stoves, uh, so instead of coal or wood, uh, they were using plastic to fuel it and to cook meals. And uh, I think uh, what they realized was it, ha it has a very, had a, has a very adverse health impact on both girls and women because they are the ones who are supposed to cook. And, and in fact, men in the house uh, can't do without it. So they're like, I want the food to be cooked on these traditional chulas itself. So uh, I think what we, we need to really understand is uh, through this one anecdotal example is that um, uh, there is an impact of every decision that gets made. Uh, and, and this is where care and climate justice came together for those girls as a group. So yeah, I just wanted to share that example. Yeah, thank you so much, Akshat. I think again, powerful example of, of both the intersection of care and climate as well as uh, how gender norms intersect in um, impacting those issues too. Nalini, uh, you've worked in the feminist movements for so many years, so many decades. Uh, what does care justice look like from a Pacific context? If you can share that, please. Um, as I said, you know, when we look, when we talk about uh, care um, or, you know, unpaid communal and uh, domestic work, you know, it has a woman's face. And when you flip it to the paid care work, but you know, it also has a woman's face. Um, it, can, it, it is changing slightly with the level of uh, qualifications that are added uh, to it now. So we see, um, you know, a shift in, 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 in the nature of who provides um, what kind of care. So elderly, uh, maybe medical care uh, in, in their homes, et cetera, you know, is shifting a little bit, but not in the majority. So for us in the Pacific, when we talk about um, care work, it is a woman's face. And it is in the, um, predominantly in a context where, you know, social norms and practices, all the stereotypes and discrimination, um, patriarchy, you know, gender-based violence, very high in the Pacific. Uh, we are talking about really low um, income being earned by women. And as I said earlier, we're only looking at 34% women in the, in the uh, you know, employment um, sector. So, you know, the, um, the indicators of women, and let me not get started with what's happening with our health indicators and, you know, all the uh, existing um, challenges that we have together with the emergent ones right now with climate crisis and all of that, it's not necessarily making the lives of women any easier. 
and we are seeing how the care work in the community um, and in the homes is, is actually getting quite difficult. Um, and then we are talking about, um, you know, having this added, um, not expectation, but an option of, of, of adding the paid element to it. Um, so from a feminist point of view, you know, we are, you know, always questioning, you know, what are we, what are we actually changing, you know? So I mentioned this earlier, like we are not changing the face of who is providing the care. We're not changing the, the concept of care being equated to the role of, you know, uh, that a woman, you know, performs. We are not redistributing anything um, in, in, in the way in which this particular industry has taken off. So for us, we, we are looking at not just changing mindsets in country, but as part of this industry um, across, you know, the world too, to, uh, to see, you know, why is even the type of care that is needed in another country needed? You know, what is failing in, in, in that country, in that, in that society, so that, you know, we have to go in to fill that. Um, so we're grappling with um, a number of these questions. Uh, we don't have responses to that, but, you know, from our side of, of you know, the, this spectrum of work, you know, we just want women to be able to make the choice for what is best suited for them. And when they do, that they have all the safety, safeguards and protection needed for them to have, um, you know, a work experience that is going to have them return home safe to their families. And so that's what I can say, what, you know, care justice looks like for us. Yeah, well, you've painted a powerful picture. Um, we're about to invite questions from the audience. So can I ask each of the panel members um, one action that you would make a difference in strengthening care policies, uh, delivery systems and movements? Um, so if you could just keep your response brief so that we can invite questions from the audience. Uh, Akshat, perhaps starting with you. Sure. Uh, so yeah, I, I think one is uh, we re really need to uh, deconstruct this language of care uh, so that we can simplistically talk to adolescents about it and and really normalize the conversations. And maybe we could we need to have a training program for boys uh, to uh, go through where they learn about cooking and household chores and unpaid care work uh, when they are in school. So maybe that and and maybe uh, and the other at policy level I would like to uh, suggest is that we need to implement this parental leave policy. Uh, so that, uh, you know, it it's almost becomes mandatory for men to also participate um, in that. And and uh, lastly, I, I guess I would like to end is, is with is that uh, we need to, I think we need to build our own organizations uh, with keeping cu culture of care at the center of it uh, so that it starts to show up in our program services. And, and we really, I, I think it will start uh, making us put more attention to mental, physical needs of uh, people within the organization. Thank you. Yeah. Nalini, one second. Uh, I just have to say, we have, have, we have to somehow begin um, to collect the data and use that for analysis. And when I say data, it needs to be disaggregated in all um, you know, facets of disaggregation. And, um, you know, and, and data is not just looking at quantitative big data, we are looking at qualitative and, and all different types of data. So uh, collecting that um, and using that to make um, the policies and the regulations and the safeguards um, is, is a step in the right direction. But you know, we, we at the same time must continue all the groundwork that we are doing to um, you know, remove discrimination, you know, remove the stereotypes and, and, you know, smash patriarchy as we are going along so that we don't have the problems we see um, these days. And Susan. Okay. Uh, one action to uh, enhance care policy and system would be for the government to establish a care innovation fund. This dedicated fund would be, uh, you know, provide a crucial financial support for the development of uh, art funds tech based care innovations, as well as acts as a crucial catalyst for the development of uh, private sector's innovation in this space. This would encourage uh, the creation of scalable and sustainable care models that utilize digital technologies to streamline care delivery, 
as well as improving the uh, uh, access to the services. Uh, in addition, this fund would be directed not only towards the technological advancements, but also towards the upskilling of care workers, ensuring that the uh, care delivery remains human-centric and also empathetic. That's very important. So it's not all about technology. And the strategic investment would uh, help build a more resilient care infrastructure capable of meeting the diverse, need, diverse needs of our society. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Um, invest in disaggregated data, qualitative, quantitative, feminist. Invest in a care fund to get funds to promising and proven care models, provide finance to advance tech-based solutions and upskilling of care workers, get more core funding to women's feminist and youth movements leading important work in this space, focus on parental leave policies and their socialisation, and commit to building organisations around culture of care and, so crucially, smash patriarchy. Uh, so with that, I'd now like to invite questions from the floor. If you can just state your name and affiliation and to whom you're directing the question, and we'll take two or three questions um, and then pass over to our panellists. Just here down the front. And yeah, over here. Okay, thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you all. Uh, my name's Amy Kutsia. I'm from the Mindaroo Foundation over in Perth. And all of you are doing just really world-changing work in each of your sectors. So just a huge thank you. I hope you pat yourself on the back often. Um, so certain, oh, and um, Akshat, I just wanted to say, it's one of the first times I've seen someone describe themselves um, for the visually impaired people of the audience. So I just really want to thank you for that. It was, um, I really took a lot from that as well. Um, so one particular question I have is actually around the cultural acceptance around the marketization of care and this being possible outsourced and, and paid for. Um, so would love to hear your thoughts in your different contexts of whether this is something that has been a challenge to change minds around, and, and if so, how, how you and your different um, roles have gone about that, or what you've seen work. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to make a comment, I just could not agree more with Susan, you said it's not just about the data, it's about changing the narrative. And I think something I heard recently that really helped crystallize it for me as well, was think we've always viewed the care economy with such a social narrative, but really flipping it to that economic one and considering that it, you know, if you think about stocks and bonds, it's an, it's a de defensive, you know, investing in stocks, it's not going away. Uh, pardon me, it's in investing in bonds, it's not going away, rather than stocks, it's such a safe investment and just kind of starting to reframe and rethink this for, for investors, especially given that most care businesses are founded by women and providing solutions that disproportionately benefit women, but the need and potential of these businesses is possibly not often adequately um, understood by majority male investors. So just thinking about that narrative as well in Australia, but thank you. And Amy, can you just summarize the question again, just great. quickly? Just sure. Briefly um, so it's around the cultural acceptance of the marketization of care, please, would love your thoughts. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, it's quite challenging for us uh, in the initial stages of love care because care, uh, unpaid care usually seen as something common. And especially if you are hiring caregivers, they are not usually called as a professional care workers. And when in the past, uh, uh, especially for our customers, when they come to us and they would like to hire a caregivers, they expect them to be a maid as well or even a superwoman that can do everything and doesn't <laughs> need to eat, doesn't need to sleep, you know. So that's also one of the work that we are doing as well, where we championing our care workers as a professional care workers. And we uh, also make a very defined uh, job scopes, like what can be done and what cannot be done by the care workers. And once the uh, uh, clients uh, they have to follow our regulations in order for them to be able to use our service. If they break the rules, then we are not providing them the service, we're rejecting them. That's something that may be unheard of because some of the startups, they would like, okay, I will serve you, and uh, the, the customer is the king. But it's very important to build this business with a long-term view where we need to earn the trust from both sides, not only for the patients or clients, but also for the care workers. We have to think about their career because become a care worker is not a sexy or you know like a dream. I would like one day become a caregiver. No, because it's not something that been uh, you know 
become a, like a prestigious, you know, like a career. I would like to be that one day. That's what that's what we are doing now at Love Care. We make this uh, job become a sexy again by providing trainings, providing uh, career advancements, and even like uh, providing them with a better payment. And of course, job scope as well. Yeah, I hope it answers your question. Melina or Chad, do you also want to add to what Susan said before we go to the next question? Yeah, I mean, and this is why I, s I keep saying that it is very important to keep talking to women because um, this option of going abroad to provide care comes in a vacuum of not having um, quality jobs in country, um, you know? And it's often seen as the last resort or the only option. So there, there comes in, in these conversations is, is an element of education and an element of awakening to realize that, oh, hang on, you know, if I leave home and go, you know, abroad Australia to provide care, in that equation, I must, you know, also fulfill the other part of the vacuum I'm, pro I'm leaving back at home, right? And who is going to provide that? Is that going to be provided by my male partner? Uh, in most cases, no. That male partner is going to find another female to come and fulfill that. So that's why I'm saying we're not changing anything in that equation. In fact, we're making it worse. Um, and whether that person coming in to fulfill the other half of the equation is going to be paid or not paid or how it is because in our communal system we, we don't go into that we rely on generosity and um you know get rewarded with a gift in the end and you know it's expected rather so that's why it's very important to keep talking to women to give them that awareness to understand how this equation works and the end goal is not that that's the job out there for you I mean, it's, it's, like I said, it's happening in the vacuum of women who are graduating out of, you know, secondary school and even tertiary institutions but not finding quality jobs. And they're going into this, um, you know, often lucratively painted ideas that this is going to be very good for me, where sometimes it doesn't uh, return up that way, as Susan was saying. Thank you. Akshat, I'll just ask you to hold for a minute because I'm conscious of time and we just want to yeah. capture a couple more questions so you can incorporate your response in response to the last two people. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, just very quick questions. I'm just wondering what is the implication of this care economy on the traditional gender uh, uh, division of labor, whether at home and at work? Because I, I would assume, because this need also shift on the gender norm in terms of the division of labor. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you have some kind of example of the feasibility of the practice of the care economy, especially in the culture or in the context where oh, the traditional uh, gender division of labor still strongly applied. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think, uh, as I said, We'll, we'll have to, because I mean, traditional divisions of labor happens within this entire system of patriarchy, right? So that like there's a power equation there. There's a reason why uh, men would not participate uh, in unpaid care work. And, uh, and, and I would like to say that if we have to really change that and uh, it'll, take a, it'll take some time, it's a behavioral change. And uh, for that to happen, we'll have to do multiple things at both grassroots level and advocacy level. Uh, and as I said, men care comes to me as a closest example, which is trying uh, to work with men and boys across the spectrum. And organizations like ours are making efforts uh, to engage boys and men as well in that process. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know how to say otherwise, like, because it, 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 uh, it's something that when starts to see, there, there's some hope when you engage with boys and in conversations, they, when they end up saying that, okay, I would like to go back and change this at home. Uh, and, but there is also backlash back home because they are going back again to the same family structure, which is also a part of a uh, patriarchal system, uh, you know, overall setting, right? So uh, um, how do we continue to create safe spaces for people to shift themselves is going to be a key question, at least from where I am seeing this. Yeah. 
a very quick question and uh, up here and then we'll have to wrap up for and maybe we'll just take these two but if we can just keep it very brief thanks yeah uh, no, uh, thank you very much Akshat for s uh, actually thank you to the entire panel actually this has been very enlightening but actually Akshat there was something that you said that made a sort of light bulb go off in my head. You were talking about, you know, in India, you know, dad is pro providing the financial care and then mum's doing the emotional care and doing all of the daily tasks. And I was actually just remembering um, in the mid 2000s when this is in the UK and there were new medical schools that were opening up. There was actually uh, several articles basically about the feminization of medicine, you know, how, uh, you know, Money, the big money is now all in investment banking. And so all the men are going to investment banking, leaving women basically to come into the NHS, to become doctors and particularly to become GPs. And how in this particular context also, uh, you know, this is doomed for the NHS because women are you know, gonna have babies and they're gonna leave and it's gonna lead to disruption, you know, the continuity of care, you know, within the system. I mean, one issue here, I guess what I'm trying to draw a parallel to is this whole issue of the migrant worker, right? Because I come, I, I'm, I'm British and Singaporean, so my family have these domestic workers working for us. My unease with that has always been, you know, this fact anyway, that there is this country now where there's an idea that care is female and cheap, right? I work for the Zao Foundation. We run a suite of services, uh, medical as well as social, you know, we look after older people. We bring in nurses, we train them at great expense, right? They don't stay because all it takes is for a hospital to come along basically and say, I'm going to give you 33% more salary, get out of the com care, the community, community care sector, come to the hospital, and they all go. So a, a really critical question here is the migration of domestic workers, this thing that these Pacific Islands are dependent on, that the Philippines is dependent on, that Indonesia is dependent on, it's actually not good for the perception of the care sector. That's one thing. The second one is how do we, I know it's been a bit discussed here anyway, for men to participate in this, I mean, given, given all the patriarch, patriarchal problems that we do have with the construction of society at the moment, it's a bit like that UK NHS debate anyway. You've got to elevate it to a point where men say, I want to do this, and I actually don't really understand how we get there. Meanwhile, in my service, we're bleeding people that we train because they just don't want to stay. There's no career path, there's no prestige. Um, it's, it's a real struggle. So it's kind of like all these issues are kind of tangled up together. So I'm not really sure how to, I'm not really sure what the question is. But I'm just simply saying this is a little <laughs> well, bit complex. Well, well, the good news is I've been told we still have another 20 minutes. So okay. that's good news. <laughs> uh, so Aksha, perhaps if you could respond to some of the strands of what was a really, um, I think, really thoughtful reflection on, on many issues that we've been struggling with. So, uh, you know, for the longest time, uh, when I was asked, what, what do your parents do? I would say my father runs a business and my mother is at home. Uh, so I, I didn't even recognize the work that she was doing. And if I have to really look at her CV, if I have to make a CV right now, she will have about 55 years of work experience where she's at least cooked one million, I calculated once and I realized she cooked at least one million rotis, Indian breads over her entire uh, life span. So I'm like, uh, I don't even recognize it as a work. So the struggle is how do we first get people to recognize and uh, especially boys to recognize that there is work happening because uh, I mean, uh, some of them would actually end up pursuing uh, the glamorous career of uh, being a chef and they'll be okay to cook at scale in a hotel for people, but they would not go back home and cook for the family. And, or maybe they would take up housekeeping job or uh, same care work, the moment it's paid in a good way, it's glamorized, you're able to do it, but you don't do it at home. So uh, I, I think my, uh, my as a response to that is how do we, the struggle is how do we create, uh, like make people understand that there's, that's work, that's real work happening. And for all you know, uh, most of us, have built our careers on that unpaid care work happening at home. It's, it, it's invisibilized to that extent, I think. So, that's we have, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, like I was saying, the, the face of care work is a woman's face. You know, for so many different reasons. It is a woman's care face, whether it could be because she's docile and she will, you know, go through what comes her way because she's thinking about her family, or, you know, she's, um, uh, you know, not, not going to be that physical enough to you know, launch with an attack if uh, abused, you know. 
Um, all of these things come, come into play. And, and the fact that, yeah, she might just be okay with um, getting minimum wage, you know, because if you're going to pay more, it is going to attract the men. Because why are more men chefs, you know, or, or are studying to be, be chefs and, 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 and getting paid that much? You put that kind of money into care work, it's the equation's going to change tomorrow, right? They will come in and take that because it's, it's a different um, uh, level of uh, thinking that goes into who picks up that job. Um, and I think um, uh, where we have been um, struggling with, and, and this is the kind of work that I was doing when I was based in Asia, was getting governments to recognize domestic work as work and, and using the terminologies that are, um, you know, uh, sort of agreed upon by, say, ILO, you know. It's domestic work. That's the, the correct term, and it's domestic workers. So if we turn that into maid or helper or something like that, you are taking away from that profession, you know. And the, and the first thing to do is to have domestic work recognized as, as work in our legislation. Then we add into, you know, recognizing it into re remuneration and our calculation of GDP or whatever you said, it's 10% of you know, global GDP, have that recognition in there. And, you know, then we move ahead in terms of providing protection. You know, not only mm. for those that are paid to do this work, but also those that are not paid to do this work. What's Otherwise, you know, we are not going to move forward in on, on this topic anyway. And this has been happening for decades. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting in India now is that in some states, they're actually providing household payments to women in households. But they're doing it because the men have realised that women are becoming more powerful in voting. And so they're doing it as a voting tactic yeah. to be able to get more women to vote for them. And so, you know, that's another form of transactional policy making. I'm conscious that you've been waiting patiently no, for a while. No, that's okay. Uh, first of all, I apologise for running out halfway in the middle of it. So if my question was kind of answered, that's okay. Um, so we see now with what Australia is doing for foreign aid and for in the Asia Pacific region is changing a lot, um, especially with the new development policy framework coming out. Um, how do you see the sort of future of the care economy in the Asia Pacific region being sort of influenced by this new um, framework and this new way of, of thinking that Australia is trying to really proposition in, in, in their aid deliverance in the region? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't fully get it. So, with the, with the new direction of Australia's aid deliverance of the new policy framework that they're propositioning, um, how do you see the care economy being impacted in the Asia-Pacific region going forward? I'm just going <laughs> to be very simple about it. It's always a two-way transaction. You know, we, we get a certain amount of aid for gender equality, climate change, etc., and then we know that somewhere on the, uh, in, in, th in that timeline, we'll have to be doing something back for Australia. We know that. And in this case, it is sending our workers across while we ourselves are suffering, and now we are receiving workers from Bangladesh and the Philippines to fill in the vacuum being created by our own people leaving. And, and we, I mean it's, it's, we are quite aware of the fact that that's the kind of equation we are going to have with the kind of aid coming in um, to support the, the issues that, that we have. So from, from my side, I know that's going to be always the play. What do you think, Nalini, about what the Deputy Prime Minister um, of Fiji spoke about um, for the opening address in terms of a visa-free Pacific? Because it seems to me that if you did work towards that, there would be more of a flow of labour through the region um, w without it actually depleting you know, one country in service of another. And so that seems to me to have a lot of potential. I mean, we need to be thinking about an ecosystem approach to how we address all forms of care, and, and that seems to be one part of a, a really com complex system. Yes, I, I do agree with our Deputy Prime Minister. And in fact, I think that might, in, in fact, be a solution to, um, you know, stop those that will overstay and, and, and um, violate their visa conditions, you know. Um, and it, it might um, avoid a whole other myriad of, of issues that, that happen um, because we'd be enabling that, that smoother travel flow. 
And of course, then, um, you know, with Fiji allowing um, those that have any connections back to the country to come back in freely uh, for business and, and later whatever it is, um, you know, all that kind of mobility is, I think, much better for the region rather than have very strict laws in place because um, it's, it's always going to end up with some issue that is going to be offshooting from, from that. Uh, maybe if I can add on about that, I, I do agree about migrations. And it's all, I think, can be uh, 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 crystallized because of the lack of access. Some are, like, you know, when the care workers from Indonesia, for example, they go to the other countries because they think that in Indonesia there are no job opportunities. There are no better job opportunities. Like, we are partnering with local schools, like nursing school as well, and then a lot of the graduates, when we ask them, what do you want to be? They are nursing graduates who are supposed to be a caregivers or nurse. But then they say, I don't know, maybe I will become a cashier in supermarket. You know, because they don't know that they will get the jobs. So when we, it's very important to provide the access, access for them to the jobs, so that between supply and demands, you know, using technology is very easy. Within minutes, you can know that where I will work, I can have the freedom to choose where I want to work and for how long. That's how uh, the powerful uh, uh, the technology can be used. And also in Australia, it's also, all, or the other countries, not only in Australia, Migration can be an option, whether I would like to go there. If in Indonesia, for example, I don't have better options, then I can go there. But again, it's about options. So they have the freedom to choose due to the uh, access that they have. Yeah. We have another question up here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Lenny from Indonesia. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Actually, talking about care economy is very complex. Yeah. And uh, we in Indonesia just... Uh, since uh, last year, under our G20 presidency, we have uh, agreed on one of our priority, which is uh, care economy. This is not only because we are going to close our gender gap on labor force participation rate, but because there will be a job creation uh, if we could have this uh, care economy in a proper place. And for Indonesia itself, uh, in addition, what uh, Susan has mentioned, because Susan from the perspective of uh, private sectors and I'm from the government, uh, we are now in the process of developing uh, the roadmap and national plan of action on care economy. And we have already identified that uh, there, were, there are seven issues among others like uh, daycare, long-term care, and there, would, there must be acknowledgement and protection for this uh, care works as well as talking about maternity leave, paternity leave, and also social protections. And now we are on the process also with the Ministry of Labor uh, on how we could uh, uh, put these care workers be part, uh, sorry, care workers to be part of the job classification. Yeah, so if they're part of the job classification means that they will have a career path. Yeah, and uh, they become the labor force as part of labor force and then finally that can con uh, could contribute to the GDP and this that's what I mentioned before this will create uh, jobs and Indonesia has already already made uh, some projections on this that we could create uh, I think it's about uh, f uh, 14 million new jobs if we could uh, do this care economy in a very uh, good way and since uh, the care works now, uh, most of them do not have social protection, so they have to take their own risks. Yeah, so it's in addition to the very strong patriarchal uh, system in, yeah, I think in many countries, yeah, not only in your country or our country, but this is the challenge, you know. And in this session, I just would like to share to all of you that, okay, if we could put all this under the job classification, all the care workers, I think that will uh, give uh, positive impacts and that will be, you know, as the guy here from Singapore and UK, uh, so they become the formal workers, not informal workers. So everybody would love to apply to that, uh, that jobs and, and also there will be a social protection fully uh, covered for them and, you know, 
It's, I think you've, you've really identified, you know, with the 40 million in, in new jobs, this really speaks to the economic opportunities in this space. It would be great to hear from you, um, since you're representing the government of in Indonesia. I know in other um, countries in Asia, at least, uh, like Nepal, they are um, adopting a whole of government approach to the care economy. They're involving all government agencies and um, it would be great to hear from you about whether that's also the approach that you're adopting in Indonesia, um, that it's not just led by one ministry, usually women's affairs, but that it is actually led by, you know, the Ministry of Treasury and Finance or Prime Ministers, um, and that it is a whole of government approach to addressing the issue of Yeah, of if justice. I may a, a bit. Actually, care economy, uh, this is the first time of uh, the history of our uh, government that uh, now it's already part of our 20 years plan. And that 20 years plan uh, is under the Ministry of Planning in our ministry. And that will become a new act on uh, 20 years plan. So with this 20 years plan, there will be presidential regulation every five years. So the next year's uh, new presidents will have a five year plan in which to, you know, to translate whatever uh, stated or amended it to this 20 years plan. And it, you know, there are KPIs, uh, detailed activities, and who does what, whose ministries, and what the, ro the role of the local government, etc. So Ministry of Social Affairs also involved in this, Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Budget, Ministry of Home Affairs, my ministry, and also the private sectors, and also labor unions, yeah. Well, there you go. There's a great model for other governments um, being represented in, in the room. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, Wendy, but I kind of am. Uh, behind the, uh, the person who's just asked a question, Wendy from ADB, it would just be great to hear from you about some of the models um, that you're seeing in your own work, because you've been doing so much around the care economy that you think are, are quite powerful um, to share with others in the room at the moment. Thank you. On the spot. Uh, um, well, first I want to really thank the panel. I was a little bit late, but I'd also met most of you before at the Bali uh, uh, event last year. And it's incredibly important what the Asia Foundation did, which was to bring together care across the life cycle, which is really what we need to be thinking about. Um, for so many reasons, some of which we talked about this morning in the aging session, which is really to be more successful older people, we really need to focus also on younger people, and we need to think about um, the entire care ecosystem. Um, I think um, in the work that we've been doing at the Asian Development Bank and trying to um, look for ways in which to support the development of this ecosystem, uh, I mentioned this morning that one of the most important uh, frame framings of this was uh, from the National Planning Agency in China, which has been moving so rapidly in the development of both childcare and um, long-term care. They said, um, we really want to fig figure out what is the role of government, what is the role of private sector, what is the role of civil society organizations and philanthropy, and what is the role of the family? And I think in every country where I've been working, that really is um, the, the, the key set of uh, questions because it deals with the regulatory environment, the incentivization, the enabling environment, um, and also um, this shift from family um, through into these other, into these other systems because it really is um, a shift. And as much as each one of these different types of care are connected, they're also different. Um, and the, and um, the, the, it's those differences that we also need to start to, to really bring out. Um, and in every, in every society, all of those stakeholders are at play. Um, and in the case of long-term care, for example, um, government has really been uh, serving the most vulnerable and poor. Private sector has really built out that top um, session. And what we're finding, uh, what, what, what we're seeing, at least in that area, is that it's really that missing middle that needs to be built because without that, you don't have a system. And you, you need all of these players to be in there and for the choices to happen. All of that is connected to the issues that Nalini's been raising also about improving um, the quality of work, decent work, um, and uh, uh, regulations and so forth. So it's wonderful that the, the kind of planning um, has been happening in Indonesia on the care economy. They're also one of the first countries which is coming forward with a national plan on aging, which covers everything um, from 
uh, long-term care through the built environment. It really looks at the um, approach of all uh, of all uh, countries. And I, I think um, I um, can't answer you in terms of um, specific models, but I think um, it's really the role of government to think through all of those stakeholders and the roles that they can play and the kind of enabling environment that they want to create there that is most important. Thanks. Thanks so much, Wendy. I think you've, you've given a really good overview as well as, of course, reinforcing the, the vital role that government plays, the, the vital role private sector plays, as well as the community sector, as, as well as, and again to Nalini's point, as well as the role of feminist movements, of the international domestic workers movement, of um, the international trade union movement. I mean, all of these movements are so important to be able to advocate for um, and realise those safeguards that will be even more important in the time ahead. Um, we've got about five minutes left, and so I'd like to just, um, unless there are any other questions, there is one question, and then I'm just going to ask uh, each of our panellists to just um, give a, a closing reflection. Sorry, thank you. Um, my name's Liz Cowan. I'm, uh, I work in the gender area at DFAT. Um, I have a question about mechanisation. Um, I've become kind of obsessed with washing machines, and I don't know if I'm insane for being so obsessed with washing machines, but you know, I think we've been talking a lot about these massive structural challenges to do with the care economy. Um, and I don't think that washing machines are going to change the structural problems, but are there ways that we can make like incremental improvements to women's lives by reducing some of the drudgery associated with a lot of care work, such as washing clothes by hand, by introducing tools, technology, mechanics? Yes, but the men won't still know which button to press <laughs> and which detergent to buy, how to turn the taps on. Yeah, so again, it'll, the burden of that will still be on the women uh, majority. Yeah, there will be some who will who'll, who'll get the hang of it, but <laughs> unfortunately, we have a lot of mechanization, but um, does it really work? You know, gas stoves to electric stoves to microwaves to blenders to... Um, every other thing, um, but you know, you still have to look at the, the time use for women and it's still going to be far greater for women than it will be for men because we know that, that when women put an average of 74% of their time doing this and even when they're in their nine to five jobs, they still put in four to six hours of unpaid care work on top of the paid work that they do in comparison to the maximum of three to maybe four that, that the men might be doing on a rare occasion. So, no, I don't think it will help. I totally agree with Nalini on this. Uh, I think we could have more and more affordable technology to reduce uh, physical labor, but the emotional labor and mental labor that goes into unpaid care work is not at, not at all even like understood, right? I mean, just the idea of even planning a meal next day uh, requires a lot of emotional labor. and. I don't know how we'll, maybe we can start using uh, chat GPT to help uh, plan the menu there. But again, to even go there and use it will eventually, who does it will be a big question, right? Uh, and I think uh, I would like to also say that um, with me men care, uh, report says that if, uh, I mean, if partners start sharing unpaid care work, it also improves their relationship, um, quality of relationship as well. So I think it has to be understood from that perspective as well. But yeah, that's my view on mechanization, uh, and I totally agree with Nalini. Okay, uh, Nalini, I must say that I am also part of the one that cannot press the button. <laughs> I have no idea how to do housework. Um, so it's all about expectation and also stereotypes. And in from the private sector, uh, especially as a technology startups founders, we see the value of technology in this case, where using our platform, we already set uh, expectations and job scope that if you would like to uh, the caregiver to provide you what kind of services basic housekeeping or uh, companionship feeding etc so you have already defined it at advance you cannot ask them to do that uh, once they arrive at your home and then you ask them to do beyond what you have already expected in advance so what we've done is that you have to define your expectation uh, at advance, and then the care workers, when they look at your request and they are, they agree 
to provide the service, then they will willingly uh, provide the service. So it's all about access again, and also opportunity and freedom to choose and to receive. And another one is about limitations. Limitation is like not only about the job, but also about the working conditions, for example, to make their livelihood, to improve the livelihood. It's also about you have enough sleep, you have enough food to eat. So we also define that uh, in advance. Our workers need to be able to sleep minimum six to eight hours a day. We have to define that clearly. Also, they, uh, uh, they are entitled to get proper meal three times a day. We also uh, define that because some people still believe that the care workers don't need to eat or don't need to sleep. You see, so it's all about educations and it's all about the technology where you have all the contract and term of conditions in place. So they cannot do beyond that. They have to be able to, uh, you know, it's all about two ways, right? You, if you want to have a quality of care, then you have to be able to provide the quality of life for the care workers as well. So that's one thing. And then maybe last one is about uh, uh, the reporting. You mentioned about the smart reporting, right? So that's also what we are doing as well at the moment. Care workers, they can do a good report, you know, but sometimes because they are very, very tired, they they are not even want to write the reports properly anymore. It's like what happening in the hospital as well. But in hospital, you can do sitting. You work in teams. While in home, home care, you are alone. You're doing it by yourself. But in love care, care workers must make a report every day. Why? Because it's to protect them as well. So if say that they are lacking of sleep, from their report, we know something is wrong. So we can protect them. And also, when, if the uh, patient same uh, likewise as well, the patient fall down, you have to able to put that in the report as well, so that you not you're being transparent. So accident is accident, so you have to put that in, in the report. But how we think, how to make their life easier, then we develop AI to help them make better reports. So you can like put all the maybe jibbers, not jibbers, but you can use your own way the word. Uh, maybe not very sophisticated or eloquent, but using AI, we can help you to organize that to make a better report. And then this can also help the, uh, the families members do the remote mentor, man, monitoring as well. So whenever they detect fall down or angry, suicide, then this will give emergency response directly to the family members, maybe in office or maybe in the other house, so that they can make better informed decision as well. So that's also part of the technology that can help improve the quality of life, not only for the patients, but also for the care workers. I hope that answers I your questions. I think you're, yeah, and I think what you've shared, Susan, is a, I mean, it's an, it's an optimal system in terms of the, the regulatory environment that Nalini was speaking about for private sector as, as much as for others, because I think what's happening even in Australia is often the Uberization of care, where people are just desperate to get um, care where a care worker is, is sick or unavailable and they're paying sometimes $100, $150 an hour just to be able to get that care support, and so which is further polarising poverty in those who have access to care and those who don't. So there are a lot of issues, I think, to unpack, much more than we have time to do today. So um, with the final question up here, um, we'll then just wrap the session. Um, Jade Anderson from Care Australia. Um, I've previously been working um, with migrant domestic workers in Hong Kong, and I guess it's more just an observation to kind of push back against, just a little bit against the assumption that um, regularisation in and of itself is sufficient. Um, in the Hong Kong context, it's a formalised um, temporary labour migration scheme, it's a standard employment contract, um, it's very often not enforced um, and um, you get a lot of, um, the challenge with care work is that it happens quite often in households, like in individual households and you get, um, it's a very intimate work space and so that you can have things that happen beyond the realms of whatever was agreed in the contract initially um, but that just make the employer happy and because uh, in the Hong Kong context, you have to, the um, migrant domestic worker must live with the employer. Making the employer happy 
um, is very important to making the um, workers' life a lot easier. So I think we have to kind of pay attention to the type of regulation and that intersection of employment regulation with immigration regulation, like where there's tied um, visas. So yeah, just to add that a little bit. Thank you, really important points. And, and of course, we haven't even really touched on the intersection of care work and gender-based violence as well, which is so prevalent in so many different contexts. Um, look, I just, if um, I can ask each of you for one minute, just one reflection, and if you could just keep it to one reflection each, um, and then we will conclude the session. Okay, I had two, but okay, I'll stick to one. Um, no, uh, look, we, ha we, we have to look at why this is happening. You know, why does Australia need overseas workers to come in and fill in this gap. You know, um, in, in Fiji, you know, where I'm from, why do we have, you know, people who want to move um, and provide this care work? So we have to dig deep and look at the foundational issues. It is about not having quality employment back at home. It is about not having the social security. It is about not having the kinds of support that your education would be, you know, enabling you to uh, get. So foundationally, we have to fix those first. Um, and, and we have to see how a person would want to remain in their country and, and contribute that way. Because I think if you ask these um, people who are moving for work um, and, 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 and say that there is an option of, of doing this kind of work and getting paid as the, the same amount and same amount of social security, et cetera, well they wouldn't be leaving. Um, maybe I can uh, uh, give one closing from the technological uh, perspective. So I would like to mention that uh, care economy is all about, you know, like human human centric uh, delivery. But we can utilize literally uh, the technology to improve the lives of not only the care workers but also the, for the patients, and. And also, it's about data driven as well. From the technology, we can collect data and also it can be beneficial not only for the private sectors, but also for the government to make better decisions whether this, uh, the, the platform or the uh, models work or not in certain areas. So really embracing the partnerships uh, with public, uh, private partnerships uh, should be done. Um, during COVID, a lot of, um, lot of people and a lot of men had to step up to take care of uh, un uh, unpaid care work at home. and But there was also a lot of humor going around it and there would be a lot of celebration of uh, men engaging in uh, care work at home. And I think, uh, I would like to say that we need to stop doing that. We need to stop uh, uh, having fun around it or using uh, language which is, which is not like celebrating as such because it's work uh, and, and also change the notions of masculinities because uh, that's what will lead to uh, also attacking the root of one of the, uh, the problem here. So um, yeah, that's, where, that's what I would like to end with. Well, that concludes our session today. I think it's been such an important conversation on the critical interventions and innovations required to advance strong care policies, delivery models, uh, movements and ecosystems. I encourage uh, you, if you're able, to join the Global Alliance for Care. It is one way of being part of a, a strong global movement for justice. And if you can please join me in thanking our phenomenal panel. Um, and thanks to all of you. And thanks to all of you who joined our session today. And let's sustain uh, that momentum for a strong movement for care justice. Thank you. <laughs>